Ben Quilty's first solo London show opened at the Saatchi Gallery this month, celebrating his winning of the inaugural Prudential Eye Award 2014. Quilty's work confronts Australian history and identity through a series of Rorschach-inspired paintings in which images of past debauchery coincide with a surface whose textures recall trees and abstract patterns. His Inhabit series, meanwhile, challenges ideas of Australian colonialism and identity through paintings of Captain Cook, evolving from a devil and into portraits of the artist. We went to the Saatchi Gallery to talk to Quilty about his exhibition, as well as past work as an official war artist embedded in the Australian Defence Force in Afghanistan, and his wider ideas about history, identity and brutality. Growing up in Australia clearly influences your work, most obviously in terms of natural landscape and history. Can you explain how these themes influence your Rorschach paintings? Um, as a, a little boy, and I had two little brothers, mum and dad took us away for two years and we travelled around Australia in a little old caravan and we were homeschooled by mum and dad. And I remember being in the, in the Western Desert in Western Australia and we stayed with a community of people there who'd been living on that land for 50,000 years. And I remember really, really strongly feeling for the first time in my life as a 10-year-old boy that I didn't really belong to this place. So the raw sharks then, especially the landscapes, reference very beautiful sites with very dark history. So Ferry Bow Falls raw shark, for example, is a site right near my home and I live in the countryside a few hours south of Sydney. It's very beautiful, very green. Um, very cold, huge deep valleys, very, very rich soil. Um, and the Gundungurra people had been living there before British immigrants started taking and clearing the land for 40 or 50,000 years. And Ferrybow Falls is one very beautiful waterfall there. There's a famous photo from that part of the world of women in parasols and men in top hats, a black and white photograph taken on the side of this waterfall um, from almost 180 years ago. And only four years before that photograph was taken, there was a massacre at the base of the waterfall of 30, between 30 and 40 Aboriginal people. Um, the men were away on the initiation ceremony, so it was women and children and elderly, and two white, young white Englishmen came and used rifles and killed, hunted and killed all of these people. So in a sense, I guess, and as a, as a retaliation f on my behalf against this whole notion of reordering history, I really feel that it's important for my, great, my, grand, my children and their children, for their society to be a healthier place to live in, that we really definitely need to acknowledge those things. And it's something that I think humans need to be very aware of, that when you reorder history, you quite often um, there's, there's there's a real pain involved in reordering history because you deny people grief, you deny people healing, you deny so much. Um, I mean, the act of denial, in a sense, is a very uh, violent thing to do. Um, so these paintings are based on Herman Rorschach's ink block tests. Um, they literally are a squashy that little children use acrylic paint and shut a piece of paper on an image and as a child it's the first time you have a sense of, of, of uh, control over a, of, over a medium like that. Um, and I've literally used that process to make these huge big paintings of landscapes and Herman Rorschach's in inkblot tests were, were designed to diagnose as a, as a pioneer of mental health research to diagnose mental illness. So if you could see something in the image, then you, were, you showed signs of para paranoid or delusional behavior. So in a sense, there's a, 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 a dark joke in the paintings that you can see something, but the audience should feel ashamed that they can see something because you're possibly showing delusional behavior. So they're very beautiful sites with a, a very dark history. Are you trying to, so what's your intention with the audience? Are you trying to, make your sort of, because with the original tests, any, anything they saw was kind of delusional or it was their own interpretation, but with these obviously you've, you've put images in there as a sort of trick almost. Yeah, well, I mean, as well as that, there's a whole act as, as a young man. Um, I've, I've grown up in, in a Western culture where there is no rite of passage, there's no initiation ceremony for my 
young men, my young male friends, we made up our own initiation ceremonies and they quite often included quite violent, self-destructive behaviour. Um, and through that process, which is really about glorifying decline, you compete with each other to fail and fail quite often in very crazy and self-destructive, violent ways. And these paintings, really, you, you destroy what's made in the first place to make something that's more beautiful, but also by destroying it, you give it a whole other layer of meaning, which is about the raw shark and about forcing the audience to view something that might be an uncomfortable truth. Um, and in the end, as an artist, I think too many artists deny the fact that there's a theatrics in having a beautiful white space and having an audience stand in front of your work is very much about theatrics. So I've always been interested in, in that space between the very surface of a painting right up close to the painting. And as you move away from it, you're confronted with something that's quite often confronting. It's ugly or, or violent or, um, or a site of massacre, something that, um, that is a confronting thing for a human being to watch. Mm -hmm. And you only view it as you move away from that painting. This one's called Self Portrait Smash. Mm -hmm. And it's from an image of me very, very drunk, which in a way is, is it, I guess it's sort of symbolic of the way we reorder history and we, we, actively, um, we actively forget. Um, and that's what you do when you get really blind drunk when you're 25 years old. You, you wipe yourself out. You wipe out a part of your history. I have two little kids now, I'm a dad and I'm 40 and my son's eight and I'm now a role model for him. So the whole drunken thing, you know, I, 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 if I can have a son who is a 19 year old man who, who doesn't want to drink and wants to be really straight, then I fucking succeeded. And I guess that part of my life is, a very, is very much in my history. But nonetheless, it's made me who I am. And I went, I, and I think the, the act of rebelliousness in young men is because there is a complete lack of any process for them to become good young men. There's no initiation ceremony. And I know I always look to Aboriginal culture in my country because I think they're an incredible race of people who lived in harmony and in a beautiful, beautiful part of the world for so long. Their initiation ceremonies for their young men takes up to 13 years and it's very physical. Uh, it's actually, from my perspective, often very confronting. And it's about finding the soul of yourself so that you can become a valuable and valued um, and respectful man. Mm -hmm. In my society, in but do you our see society, this as there's maybe, nothing. Do you see this as an, an initiation ceremony, art practice and... Yeah, well, for me, that's exactly what it is, yeah. No doubt about it. And, and for me, painting was... And I read, I went to a very good art school in Sydney, at Sydney University, and Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction was one of my favourite essays, but it really hinted on, at the fact that painting had been superseded. But for me, outside of art, contemporary art practice, the fact that I could pick up an implement and have a pigment and make a mark and make a statement, nothing could touch that for me. And I think that was all about being a young man and, and, and a straight white male and having that output which was completely esoteric, was completely meaningless. In a way it was like a Latin mass. It was a very important thing for me and to find myself and then to comment on the, why I think young men have such troubles finding themselves. And they should all just paint and then they'd all be right. This, this work comes out of um, these two portraits, particularly are, are very famous portraits of Captain Cook by Nathaniel Dance, sorry, these two here. Um, very, two very different portraits of the same man and they asked his wife after he died, which portrait would you rather him be remembered by? And she was very adamant that, in my view, it was the much more effeminate version of him as a sort of looking more like an English aristocracy with powdered cheeks and, and poofed hair, um, which in a way was the absolute antithesis to what my sense of identity as a male is, that, you know, this much more chiselled seafarer is, is what today 
is seen as the, the ultimate masculinity, form of masculinity. So this body of work started with that. Um, and, and in a sense, uh, um, the idea of animating paintings from one painting to the next, from the devil at one end, and then through to self-portraits made sitting in front of a mirror at the other end. Um, and I, I mean, I was sort of criticised for, for suggesting that Captain Cook's somehow associated with the devil, but if you're an indigenous Aboriginal Australian, then Captain Cook is symbolically definitely symbolises the end of their community, the end of their dream time, the end of their culture, and quite often very destructive um, and violent death as well. So I didn't think it was too far a stretch. And then if you include yourself as an artist in your work, then you can say anything you want. Mm -hmm. And I believe that you do have to be, I think artists are pretty self-aware. All of us are very self-aware human beings and therefore it's pretty natural that you end up putting yourself in your work. And it's understanding yourself through history as well, so it's more subjective in that sense. Yeah, look, the, no, the notion of history that I hope this work talks about is, is a history that I think humans are very good at uh, readapting to suit their sense of um, national pride or um, social identity. And, and there's been, particularly in Australia over the last 25 years, a real reordering of history. And quite often I think that's um, a very tragic uh, erasing of parts of history since European colonisation a raising of the violent history to do with the indigenous people who've been there for 50,000 years, who know the country far better than we will ever know it, far better than my great-grandchildren will ever know that place. It was um, a type of social death as well, and I suppose you're, talk you're, look you're looking at the perpetrators of that rather than... Yeah, well, I'm the perpetrator of it. I'm, my blood is Irish. Um, I'm part of that legacy of, of what... what um, the globalisation of the planet, what, what it is about, that we, we've, that borders have broken down, that identities are becoming looser, and that's one part of it, and I've lived it and witnessed it, and although I'm Australian on my passport, I still feel that my blood is very Irish, mm -hmm. and that the real, real uh, contenders for Australianness are the indigenous population who've been there for so, so, so long. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think about your own and other Irish and Scottish and new immigrants? What should the identity be then in, as an Australian? Because you're well, not look, Irish I mean, per se. Saying that, yeah, it's a good point. As an artist, it's just a completely idealistic argument. Mm -hmm. It's completely unrealistic. There's no way that... But, but I think that one of the roles of an artist is to point out the things that are so idealistic that they're unreal, so that you can have a discourse, so that we can become a... a so that the fibre of the societies that we're from becomes richer and stronger. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you actively discourage open um, versions of history, then you really damage the social fibre of the place that you live. And, and there's a lot of things, I mean, I'm, I'm going after this show, I, I'm living in Paris for three months, and there's a very infamous bridge in Paris, yeah. which Algerians were thrown off that bridge. Yeah. Hun uh, piles of dead bodies were thrown off that bridge into the river, mm -hmm. and, and the French have reordered their own history. Every country does it. Re history is constantly reordered to suit the paradigm it's, it's the way we are. The winner's and right history, is that yeah, idea? So yeah, you're sort of, of course. contesting that? Uh, yeah, yeah, and artists do that, that's what we do. Do you think that's a, a kind of moral obligation? Or oh, do you think, think it's natural with art? No, I think we're dri artists are driven to do that. I think most artists, uh, I mean, I, I, th I think it's sad, but I think in a way artists replace the, the historical figure of the philosopher and that we examine and, and kind of tear apart social norms and, and you look in the face of a taboo, then, then you start to get more of a sense of what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. The gallery asked me to, to install the work this way, um, which is something that I've developed and it really started off in the studio as a way of sort of scarifying the space, of breaking down the high-brow notion of what painting is about, that it, 
that it has this history, which is, is an uncomfortable history. And in a sense, the reason that the essays were written about the death of painting was because it became so highbrow. And it, I feel like it sort of lost touch with the fact that in the end, it's about using a pigment in the surface and particularly as a young man, making a statement about your existence. And the aerosol as the most lowbrow form of paint um, and illegal, really, to then walk into a museum like this and fuck with the walls, destroy the surface of the walls, um, and then place paintings on top of it. I, I guess it's about the notion of trying to build a frame, uh, that, that I'm building a frame, but the frame is more about my own history and, and marking the surface instead of ornate gold frames, which you'd find in the museum up the road. I, I'm, allowed to destroy the wall to show off the paintings. Um, yeah, well, in 2011, I went to Afghanistan and it's, uh, it's a, a, a long residency program, 100 years they've been doing it. The Australian War Memorial's been sending artists to, to all over the world to cover war. Um, and the Australian Defence Force is very paranoid about journalists going there. We get a very sanitised version in the media about what war is like. And really, the War Memorial facilitates us going there and telling the story the way it is. And they back us up and they took us everywhere. And I had absolute access to everyone and everything, including the Special Forces, mm -hmm. and the opportunity to go with them. And uh, quite confronting and horrendous, really. But because my work's for many years been about my own sense of my own masculinity and identity, um, I felt very compelled to go and tell their story because in a way they're not conscripted to go to Afghanistan in that war, they were all there by choice and in a sense for me that was sort of the ultimate um, final madness of masculinity of why these young men want to be there. And I read, I mean, I read All Quiet on the Western Front, that incredibly confronting book when I was 13, which is probably a bit too young, I think, for a little boy to read that. But it um, really instilled in me an absolute fear of, of conscription. Mm -hmm. um, and I was born the year after the Vietnam War finished for, for Australians. That was a very serious engagement. A lot of men were conscripted and a lot of hundreds and hundreds of Australians died in that war. So for me, conscription felt very real. Uh, and I wanted to go there as, a, as sort of a, an older man, not, not 18 anymore, with plenty of fear and um, a lot of questions to ask these young men about why you're here. Why did you want to do this? Why did you want to be involved in something? Um, and all the other questions, have you been involved in death? Have you been with someone when they've been killed? Have you killed someone? Mm -hmm. And I was given the opportunity to ask those questions. So it's inevitable as an artist that the answers to those questions won't inform your work and they really inform that particular body of work. Mm -hmm.